Welcome to session 180 of Scanner School. This is an Ask Scanner School session where I answer your questions. All the notes from today's podcast can be found on our website at scannerschool.com slash session 180. Today's podcast is sponsored by our two brand new training courses. Our free SDR course, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Software Defined Radio, will get you started with SDRs in an afternoon. We will show you what hardware and accessories to buy to get started with Software Defined Radio. Then we'll show you the step-by-step how-to to to install the drivers, tune your first frequency with SDR Sharp, and then have you monitoring digital at the end of this free course. Our advanced course continues with beginner's course left off and levels up your SDR experience. In this course, you'll learn even more about software-defined radio. We will show you how you can substitute an SDR for your high-end digital scanner, how to monitor HD radio, monitor trunk systems and overhead data with Unitrunker, and even how to monitor all the talk groups on a system and never miss a beat with SDR trunk. You can sign up for both courses at courses.scannerschool.com. Before we start this week's podcast, I'd like to take a moment to thank our Patreon supporters. Patreon is a month-to-month sponsorship platform. We have three different support tiers, each with different benefits. But the most valuable tier is our $5 a month tier. This equates to sponsoring the podcast for about a dollar per episode. Now, not only do our $5 Patreon supporters receive the podcast early, but they also receive a commercial-free version of the podcast delivered directly to their podcast player. Some may say that the included squelchy sticker pack that is mailed to your home is the best benefit of the $5 level, but I think it's the community or the club that is growing at this level. You see, we meet once a month on Zoom, and we have a roundtable discussion about scanning, ask questions, offer advice. Some of the members are answering other people's questions, and we just talk with our fellow scanner school classmates. This is an exclusive group for our $5 Patreon members. Now, again, if all this wasn't enough at that level, you'll also receive discounts to upcoming Scanner School courses and offerings. Now, you can help support Scanner School by going to www.scannerschool.com slash Patreon or www.scannerschool.com slash support. Now, I'd like to thank all of our Patreon supporters at all levels, and they are Bill K, Brian King, Buzz Gold, Chris Paris, Craig Harper, Dan, Dave Pasco, David C, Danny Crotty, Ed Walsh, Eddie K, Edward Bramlett, Evan Barak, Greg Johnson, Guy Lee, Jay Haycock, James Broxson, James Felling, James Peruta, Jeff Block, Jeff Chapman, Jenny Taylor, Jim B, Jim Heinrich, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Kevin Zwicky, Lenny Bauer, Les Stevenson, Lynn Smith, Mark Beebe, Mason Kramer, Michael Kroger, Paul Teal, Raymond Hill, Robert, Robert Kanzler, Ronnie Bach, Sal Marandola, Signals Everywhere, Tim Mas- Todd Glendie, Tom Barrick, and William Arcand. Now let's start the podcast. Welcome to The Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. Welcome to Scanner School. This podcast is here to teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and my amateur radio call sign is W2LIE. Today, I am answering your questions. So I have several questions that come in via email, but I always give priority to those who ask me a question via our voicemail number, which again is 516-308-2885, or via SpeakPipe, which again we found over at scannerschool.com slash ask. And that's exactly what we have on today's podcast. We've got more of your questions in your voice. Now, this is also great because... That means everybody who's on today's podcast has an opportunity to win a free tutoring session. Now, a tutoring session with me is normally an hour long, and we use Zoom or Skype to share screens and do a face-to-face, if you're comfortable with that, by the way, but a face-to-face where I I help you out with whatever it is that you need help with when it comes to the scanner radio hobby. Sometimes it's setting up a scanner. Sometimes it's just understanding how software works, or it can be how to use system keys or group keys or how your SDR can function. So these are the kinds of questions that I normally get or I can get when it comes to a tutoring session. Now, if you want to book me for a tutoring session, again, you can go to scannerschool.com slash tutoring or submit your question and you can be in the running for a free tutoring session. So don't forget, you can also join us tonight if you're catching this podcast on the release date 
where I'll be answering your questions on YouTube and Facebook Live and also Periscope, which is a part of Twitter, and possibly even Instagram. Because again, it's the first Tuesday of the month, just like every other first Tuesday of the month, we're answering your questions live. And for those of you who are our Patreon extra credit members at the $5 limit, you also will get a special roundtable discussion, which usually goes by another hour on Zoom. So uh, again, you can catch us over at scannerschool.com slash Patreon for that. But enough of this, enough of the blab. Let's get right into the question. So my first question is kind of a carryover from last week. So unfortunately, Chris, I'm not going to put you in the pool for the tutoring session only because it wouldn't be fair to everybody else because you're, you'd be double dipping. <laughs> so, But I'm going to replay Chris's question from last week because after the podcast session aired and even after we were discussing it on our Patreon meeting, Chris kind of figured out what the answer was on, and, he, and he let me know. And now it's light bulb moment seems so obvious. So let me go ahead and replay Chris's question to refresh your memories on what he was asking, and then I'll come back in with the answer that um, that Chris actually discovered, and it actually might work. Well, I haven't heard any feedback yet, but Chris, why don't you go ahead and ask your question one more time? Hi, Phil. This is Chris Paris of the Federal Wavelengths Column with a question for you. Over the years, many people have claimed that the close call function on unit and scanners doesn't work with aircraft reception. I can say that that's not true, that aircraft do come in on close call reception just fine on the unit and radios. But I had an incident recently, which I've noticed is kind of hindering that. I had a chance to spend some time at a major airport and had my unit and 536 scanner set up, and it was catching plenty of traffic from aircraft on a close call, but the communications were all coming up in the VHF aircraft band, but in the FM mode. And I looked and looked and looked and can't find anywhere in the menu settings in the 536, and I'm assuming the 436 is the same, to set the auto mode or set whatever mode the close call reception should be in. And I don't know if this is an issue with the scanners or just something that I haven't programmed properly, but the first time I've run into it. So I thought I'd leave this question for you and see if you can come up with an answer for me. Thank you. So to answer Chris's question in his own words, basically, if you hit the function button and then you hit the channel button, which is the button on the very bottom right hand side of the front keypad, that's the modulation button. Now, once he pointed that out, it just seems so obvious. Oh, yeah, there's three little red letters on that key that says M-O-D. And wouldn't you know it, when you press function and then that button, it cycles through the different types of modulation on the scanner. So it will cycle through AM, narrow FM, wide FM, FM broadcast, and auto. So hopefully the scanner is smart enough to know that AM modulation should be used in the aviation band. I was also heard, I think we talked about it on the air with Larry uh, last two weeks ago, that there is a band setting in the scanner where there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a band channel plan in there. And of course, that's also where you map where things are AM, air FM, or wide FM, or narrow FM, the whole deal. So I know I went into my scanner, I double checked it, and my channel plan is set up correctly where the aviation spectrum should be AM. But again, if Chris and I were playing around with our scanners and we accidentally changed the modulation in close call, then instead of being set to auto and hopefully working in AM in the AM the, uh, aviation band, it might have been set for FM. So, Chris, I want to thank you very much for closing the loop on this one and reaching out via Twitter and, uh, and coming to the solution. And again, I haven't had a chance to go to an airport and check it out to make sure it was working. But I know you travel a lot more than I do, so maybe it's working for you. So, again, thank you, Chris, for closing the loop on that one, for stumping me, and also for uh, for coming back with the correction. All right, let's go on to our next question, which was called in, and this one comes in from Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. Okay, Phil, this is Jeff Chapman, WA3RIZ, with a question about the P25 trunking. I want to challenge the notion that when listening to a P25 network, you are limited to the SDR bandwidth. If I can set an SDR to basically any frequency I want, why, when I put it into a trunk configuration, can I not also do the same? Or why can't I do the same? In other words, the trunking software, if you will, should be able to set that frequency to anything and not be limited to just that 2.4 megahertz or 3 megahertz bandwidth of the receiver. 
this actually feels like a software problem more than a hardware problem or not necessarily a problem of the software, but an approach or methodology. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Thanks. So, Jeff, it's not really an issue with software. It does have more to do with hardware. Now, I don't know what software you are using with your software-defined radio, but it has more to do with, with reusing the resource of the radio, right? So the typical SDR has got, what do they say, 2.4 mega samples per second, and that's the bandwidth, right, of the of the uh, the receiver. But you got to remember there's roll-off on either side of it, right? So for most pieces of software, if you're using the like the Nualec SDR or even the RTL blog SDR that's got about a 2.48 megahertz wide footprint, the actual usable before the roll-off, right, is about 2 megahertz or 2.048 megahertz. So anything you're going to use on an active running SDR has to fall within that footprint. So here's the trick. A lot of pieces of software out there like Unitrunker or Trunk SDR will allow you to have multiple VFOs on a single SDR. So what happens is if you take a single SDR and you park it on a control channel, right, that means that that SDR is now centered on that frequency. You can go plus or minus basically one megahertz to either side of that usable control channel. So if you were on, say, 851.3625 and 851.5625, you would be able to monitor both of those frequencies off of a single SDR because they fall within the 2 megahertz sweep, basically. When you run into stuff like the 700 megahertz band, where you've got a little bit more of, of a bandwidth there, that's when you run into issues. But again, if you run two or three or four SDR dongles, you now can do two megahertz, two megahertz, two megahertz, two megahertz, right? Depending on where the sample or the center frequency is. And again, too, if you're only using them for voice channels, you're going to use it for the center, and then you're going to let go of that uh, SDR when there's no more voice channels on it, and then it'll put that SDR back in the pool. So let me see if I can say it a different way here. So you've got a control channel, right? Again, let's say 851.5625. You can do 851.5625. 0325, if that's even a, a standard split, probably not, right? 851.0125 maybe is, is the offset. And you can go up maybe 850, high 850, low 852s, right? So anything within that 2 megahertz, you can assign to different trunk control channels on the VFOs, right? As long as it's with 2 megahertz or megahertz either side by side. And as long as, as again, as long as it was in that 2 megahertz footprint, you can have as many instances of control channel decoding as you want. When it comes to voice channel, right, it still holds the same way. So you have a voice grant, a receiver is that is dedicated to a voice role will go over to the voice channel and it will it'll play, right? It'll it'll tune into it. Now if there's another voice grant that's within that two megahertz or that one megahertz side by side, then that same receiver can be used to make a, a separate VFO on the same same hardware, and then be heard there as well. Likewise, if you have a control channel radio, a control channel SDR, you can do control channel and voice following, as, again, as long as it falls within that same 2 megahertz. This is why when things start to grow and they start to be a little bit larger, people start upgrading into software farm radios such as the AirSpy, which can give you 6 to 8 megahertz, or the SDR Uno, or the SDR Play devices, Sorry, SDR Uno is the software. It's the SDR Play, right, hardware. Or even the Hack RF, where you can get 10 to 20 megahertz of usable bandwidth. And then again, that all cuts down on the amount of hardware you need. Again, as you're going to be able to bring in more data, right, you're going to be able, you're going to be spending more money. So sometimes it's just better off to spend, you can buy a good handful of dongles at $30 a pop that would cost you for a Hack RF or, you know, something else. But again, you got more filtering on the higher end stuff. So again, it's not so much a software issue as it really is a hardware issue. So again, we can explain this a little bit better, a little bit more if you want on a, on a one-on-one or via, via email chat, you know, shoot me an email, phil at scanschool.com. This is really the, the short answer on how it works and why they are set up this way. But again, it does have a lot to do with where this, where the SDR is being parked and then what else it can do after it's parked on something. Again, one megahertz typically on either side. Again, this is also why it's good if you're launching software to try and launch 
control channels that are within close proximity to each other. This way, maybe you set up this, the center frequency and then you go low to high so that you can also, you know, better use the hardware resource that is out there. Really great question, Jeff. I'm, I'm really happy you're asking an SDR question. And again, this ties in very nicely to uh, another question we have on the other side of the break. So, but before we get there, I got one more question uh, from Jack Ritchie, who's got a really good question, which definitely deserves its own podcast episode. Jack, go ahead. Hi, Phil. It's Jack Ritchie in southwestern Ontario, Canada, near Detroit, Michigan, near Windsor, Detroit. Have you ever had any references to Bill Cheek's material, scanner material, publications? Do you know where we can find a library full of his stuff, or is it all taboo at this point? Well, let us know. Have fun. All right, Jack. So, Mr. Bill Cheek, he was a pioneer in the mid to late 90s in the scanner radio hobby. Single-handedly, he's responsible for a lot of the advancements, I think, when it comes to the scanner radio hobby. And some of the stuff he did got him in trouble. Let's just put it that way. Okay, and Not so much of what he was creating, what he was doing. It was more of how he was marketing it. So let's back things up a little bit. Again, I, I think this is a whole really great podcast episode. And if anybody is very familiar with the backstory of of Bill Cheek, I would invite you to come on to the podcast because Bill's activity fell right in that area of life where I kind of fell out of the scanner radio hobby a little bit, thanks to basically just discovering girls in college and everything else that falls into that area, right? That was that was that was about, you know, the high school college time for me. So yeah, uh, scanning wasn't really a big part of my life at that time. But um a lot of what he's done, right? He's he's pretty much modified, and, and you can still find some like Radio Shack Pro 2004s, uh, 2005s, and 2006s, especially that have been modified based on Bill Cheek's guides. And yes, a lot of what Bill Cheek did put out and did publish is kind of difficult to find. So Bill Cheek, he actually had his own. He had he has several documents that are out there. So he's got the scanner modification handbook and how to upgrade your scanner. And again, I am looking at a page right now that's um, at thriftbooks.com and it's in good condition for $6.19. So you can actually find a hard copy of that book. There's acceptable versions of his books as well for $3.99. You can also find some stuff on, looks like on Amazon. I was pulling out something there on Amazon as well. And also the Internet Archive is great too. I'm actually pulling up a lot of his old print newsletters that he used to mail out. And this was called the World Scanner Report. And it was typically a very small publication that looked like it was really printed from a DOS computer. A lot of it is dated for the time. Some of it is though done a lot better once you know they, they started getting getting more subscribers, it looks like you know things kind of went uh, to actually formatting and publishing with boxes and stuff like that. It doesn't look like it was so so um, done on, on a computer in a basement type of deal. But that's not to say the information that's in it isn't great. It's just as you can sell, tell how things evolve, right? Things things are, are up there. So again, if you look at archive.org, org, you'll saw, you'll find some of Bill Cheek's publications in there. Even Comtronics Engineering, you look under that as well. But again, a lot of his stuff is still available online. A lot of his stuff, though, is hidden online or taken down because a lot of people got scared after Bill and his wife were arrested. And again, that I don't want to spill the beans here, but it really is um, kind of a sad story in the scanner radio world. So, so basically, back in 1999, uh, he was uh, woken up in the morning while he was having his cup of coffee, basically, with a knock on the door from U.S. Secret Service, FBI, Customs, Postal Inspector, and you know, and cops. And basically, they did a search and seizure of his, of his property because a uh, even though he lived across the country and he was he was west coast my local department actually here the local police department here in Long Island, new york somebody was posting on the internet some mdt screen captures basically of um of the local department and uh it was it was all done based on hardware that uh that bill cheek had sold not that the equipment that bill was selling was supposed to be used for that it's just that it could be used for that 
And this is kind of where things kind of got into the gray area and uh, where things kind of happened around Mr. Cheek. But all in all, I mean, his heart was in the right place with everything. Um, Unfortunately, somebody used something that he had and it really did a number on Bill Cheek and family. So I won't get into the full story here, but uh, but yeah, if you do look hard enough out there, his information is still there. You can still find his publications. You can still find his books. And uh, you can still find his modification guides and whatnot. And if you look really hard on eBay too, every once in a while, you can find a radio that was modified. In fact, I let one slip right between my fingers not too long ago either. So um, I'm, I'm kind of annoyed that I, I let that one go. But eh, whatever. You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. But again, if anybody knows the history of Bill Cheeks and could speak about him better than I can, I would love to have you on the podcast so we could talk about the history of Bill Cheek, what he did to the hobby, as far as all the good stuff that he brought into the hobby and you know, all the knowledge and, and the newsletters and the bulletin board service he had set up. And ultimately, again, like we talked about, what um, what led to uh, his, his arrest and the lawsuits and um, health issues that, that followed. All right. So not to end this on a down note, but Jack, yeah, they're all still out there. And a really great question and a really great topic too. All right. So on the other side of this break, we will continue on with the last two questions. And as a reminder, too, if you're a Patreon support at $5 level, you won't even hear this break. So stick around and we'll be right back. Did you know there are ways to help support the Scanner School podcast that doesn't take any time or any extra money on your part? If you go to scannerschool.com slash support, you will find we have several ways that you can continue to do your online shopping and help support us. We have links To Amazon. If you click on our link before you go to Amazon, anything you buy from there will help support Scanner School. Now, if you're in a market for a brand new scanner, an antenna, other accessories, we have links to Scanner Master, where you can not only purchase a scanner and accessories, but you can also get your radio programmed. And by clicking on our link before you buy, you are helping to support the podcast. Now, if you're in a market for software, we have links to Butel. And if you want something new to you, we also have links to eBay. Again, just go to scannerschool.com slash support before you make your purchases, and you are helping to support Scanner School at no additional cost to you. This session of Scanner School is sponsored by East Coast Pagers. Now, East Coast Pagers is one of my online companies, and we are a Unication, Apollo, and Swiss phone dealer serving the North American market. Now, if you're looking for a personal use pager or one for your department, we can get you a quote at the very best prices. So why does a company like East Coast Pagers support Scanner School? I think that every Scanner Reader user should at least put one pager in their collection of radios. The reason why is very simple. It frees up your scanner to just do scanning, and then you have one radio that's dedicated to your local fire activity. Now, with a pager, you can have voice storage. You can do tone outs. You can keep it silent. You can go back the next day and listen to what you've missed overnight. It's more than you can do with an out-of-the-box scanner. And with today's pagers having multiple frequencies and even having multiple channels in a scan list, like the Unication G1 can do eight channels in a scan list. It has 64 memory channels, and out of the box, it comes with 11 minutes of stored voice and a desktop charger. The G2s to G5s, they do P25 phase one and phase two in simulcast environments with stored voice, paging on conventional NP25. Oh, and they're upgradable too to DMR type one and type two. They are more rugged than today's consumer based scanners. And with a pager like a Swiss phone S quad, you won't even realize you're wearing one. It'll help keep you informed as to what's going on in your neighborhood. So again, eastcoastpagers.com or contact me directly phil at eastcoastpagers.com do you have a new scanner you're having problems understanding how it works maybe you're new to the entire home patrol database of programming and you can't figure out sentinel did you get a new sdr and you're trying to figure out how to install it or you want to learn how to use unitrunker dsd plus maybe set up a pioware or even just make some changes and you don't understand how the system and the equipment works The podcast might be great for you, but maybe you need a little bit more of one-on-one help with setting something up. I'm available to do just that with you with our private tutoring sessions. You can book me online by going to scannerschool.com slash consulting for a one-hour session. And it's great because we can actually share computer screens remotely, and I can guide you through step-by-step as if I was sitting right next to you. So again, book me for an hour at scannerschool.com slash consulting for your scanner radio one-on-one tutoring session. 
National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your NatCom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of America's Hobby Radio Magazine, as well as back issues, too. So visit natcommag.com to download your free sample issues and sign up today. That's natcommag.com for National Communications Magazine. Okay, so our next question comes in from Ray. Ray, go ahead with your question. Hi, Phil. This is Ray from Florida, W4RHG. And my question is, as we work our way through the courses, are there any special considerations or locations we should use when backing up our work folders? Thanks a lot, Phil. Bye-bye. All right, Ray. So thank you very much for being a student of the Scanner School SDR course or courses. Not sure if you're in the, the Ultimate Beginner's Guide or if you've actually opted into the Advanced course, which is our paid course. Either way, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to go through the course material. So if you're in the basic course, there's no real worries about backing anything up. We've created a folder on your hard drive called SDR where the software will live. Any of the software we talked about in the basic course basically will run, live, and be uh, stored in the SDR folder. That includes SDR Sharp, and we were also using DSD Plus in there as well. Anything else that's in there, Notepad++ got installed as a typical Windows program, so there's no issues with, with moving that around as well. You can go ahead and back anything up you want. You can back it up to another drive. You can back it up to another folder. You can move it to another computer. You can even direct copy that SDR folder and move it to another computer. It should all work just fine for you. In fact, I've got it backed up to three drives in my computer. I've got it backed up on, I got it running off the C drive. I have it backed up to my D drive and my D drive backs up to my E drive if you follow along. But I can run anything in that SDR folder from any one of those three drives. When we get into the advanced course, this is where things start to get a little bit more trickier. So some of the software we play around with in the advanced course actually gets installed as Windows-based software. So because of that, there's dependencies and there's, there's firm file path names and, and extensions and stuff like that. So in that course, anything we install in the SDR folder, yes, you can copy and archive out. But when it comes to anything that's not installed in the SDR folder, such as anything that's installed into program files or program, was it x86, whatever it is, those were stuck, right? We can we can find some of the, the actual files, such as like Unitrunker is actually stored in your app data folder. You can back that up. But some of the stuff is really just uh, is stuck in where they are. So, Ray, great question. Again, thank you so much for being a, a course participant. And again, anybody who's looking to learn more about software-defined radios can come in at courses.scannerschool.com. And you can sign up and take our free software-defined radio course. And if you opt into it, our advanced course, which will tell, teach you so, so much more. Ray, again, great question. Thank you so much. And we have one more question from Jim. Jim, go ahead with your question. Hi, Phil. My name is Jim Barrett, and I've been listening to you for the last couple of months or so. I was turned on to your podcast by uh, Michael Bazell over at uh, Intel Techniques. And he did a whole segment on um, RF monitoring and, and, and mentioned your uh, podcast is a great place to get some education. So uh, it's been really, really great. Uh, obviously, um, you know, I, I, I used to be a podcaster myself, so I immediately threw down for the Patreon uh, contributions because, you know, I, I, so few people bother to do it, and we all get so much useful information out of it. So I really encourage, you know, people to, to spend, even if it's a buck or something, just just throw something towards podcasters that are doing such a great job like you are. But anyway, um, enough background. Here's my question. I'm a ham radio operator. I've had my ticket for about a year, year and a half. And so, you know, scanners are kind of a natural uh, movement in that direction. My question concerns antennas. And specifically, uh, I've been really beating my head against the wall because as, as I'm learning more and more, different frequencies require different length antennas. But at the same time, there are frequencies where the same antenna can actually be resonant on more than one frequency. And I know it's a function of the wavelength, the function of the length of the antenna, and that sort of thing. And 
you know, this may be too long a question for an Ask Scanner School. It might be something to defer to a, a separate podcast. I went back through your back catalog and didn't see anything where you'd really talk specifically about that. So anyway, I want to throw that out there and see if you know, maybe you could comment on, um, you know, kind of how to calculate if you've got an antenna of X length. Um, how do you figure out what wavelengths and what frequencies uh, it will be resonant on and or close to resonant on and that sort of thing? All right, uh, doing a great job. Thanks again, and um, I hope to hear it. All right, bye-bye. Jim, thank you so much for that long background information and for sharing a little bit and also for being a Patreon supporter. In fact, I did run over to the IntelTechniques.com website to find the podcast episode that you were referring to, and that's actually episode 204 radio frequency monitoring. Again, we'll put a link to that over in the uh, the session notes. But I started listening to that podcast before I started recording this episode, and I had to hit pause on it because I was getting sucked into the podcast episode. So I'll I'll definitely be reaching out to Michael to have a little conversation with him and uh, see if we can do a podcast swap. That was, from what I've listened to so far, really great storytelling, really great podcast, and I'm looking forward to finishing up that episode, which I'll probably do tomorrow while I am listening to to work. So anyway, to answer your questions, this is a good one. This is something that I haven't had. Well, I mean, besides hobby wise, but uh, something I really haven't looked at in quite some time. Well, I used to do with this stuff all the time when I was in school. And that's one of the things that are in theory, right? I think there's a lot of theory in there. And uh, the last 20 years, I haven't really based myself into theory so much as it is uh, like recently my job I, I draw lines to boxes that's kind of it right I understand how things work but I don't have to do the calculations that are around it so to answer your question let's go let's go very simple with this right multiple frequencies on the same antenna and, and a lot of that has to do with because of typical or, or just physics right I'm, I'm going to read off some numbers here so I do some calculations and let's give you the formula first so the formula basically to find out the wavelength, right? The, the 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 length of the wavelength is basically the wavelength equals C, which is the speed of light over the frequency. That gives you the wavelength of the frequency, right? So the speed of light, that is a good one. So I'm looking at my little fancy dancy uh, cheat sheet here, which we will will link to in our session notes. So we've got this formula, right? We've got lambda or wavelength, right, in meters equals C over F. So if we take that formula and we pop in 150 megahertz, we get a, a half wave length of 3.12 feet. I know I'm talking feet now, but I'm in freedom units. 450 megahertz is 1.04. So that's not really half, is it? But you got to remember, antennas have a little bit of a Q factor on them. So the antenna will work over a little bit larger frequency range, right? It's a little bit more forgiving. So you can almost use a 150 megahertz antenna also for 450. But the magic number here is we have a 450 megahertz antenna, which is about 1.04 feet at half wavelength. 851 megahertz, the antenna is almost exactly half as tall or 0.549 feet tall. So this gives a good match between 450 and 851. Likewise, if we're looking at, again, a quarter of a wavelength, they're almost exactly half as well. So when we look at the length of an antenna, we have basically 468 divided by frequency gives you a half wave dipole. That's the formula. So again, that's how we figure out how long an antenna has to be. And again, if we use that and we figure out Okay, quarter wavelength in this frequency, half wavelength on that frequency. We can start stacking and figuring out, okay, what's what's a good wavelength to use that will get us more of uh, what we want to do on certain frequencies. So let's take a look at a disc cone antenna. Now, a disc cone antenna, you've got basically two antennas on there. You've got the, the cone right below it, and then you have a whip on top. Now, that whip has a coil in it. And a coil acts as a filter, right? It basically does not let frequencies pass through it. It kind of makes it look like it's the end of the antenna. So, for example, I've got in my backyard, I have a Cushcraft R6, I believe, antenna. Or maybe it's an R7. And it has, it has traps, right, coils in the vertical antenna. And this antenna is resonant on 10 meters, 12 meters, 17, 20 30, I believe, and also a very small sliver on 40 meters. Again, very small because of the Q factor in there. But there's coils in there, right? There's traps. 
And what happens is, is the antenna looks shorter on those higher frequencies. So at 10 meters, basically the antenna looks like it ends at the first coil. Or at 12 meters, the next coil. And then at 20 meters, the next coil. And at 30, the next. And then finally at 40, it sees the whole length of the antenna. So that's also how we can change the aspect or the the length or the the or the wavelength of the antenna. A lot of physics comes comes into play here when we look at antenna modeling and how things work. And again, you have to look at too: is it going to be require ground? Does it need a ground plane? If it's horizontal, how high off the ground does the antenna need to be before the antenna the antenna's pattern gets a little goofy and gets gets all uh, skewed up? So there's a lot of different things that come into play when we look at modeling and creating and looking at different antennas. But again, for the basic dipole antenna, it's very simple. 468 over your frequency will give you the length of the antenna. So now, for example, if you want to figure out the actual length of the antenna, you can do that very simply. Again, we have 468 divided by, for example, 851 would give us a half wavelength antenna for 851 megahertz at 0.54 feet or half a foot more or less. Now, if we take a quarter wavelength at 450 megahertz, that gives us about 0.52 feet. So you can see 0.54 feet at a half wavelength for 851, it's just about the same length of antenna for a quarter wavelength for a UHF antenna. That's kind of why we get a match off of those. Now, again, you've got other characteristics in there, such as gain and and stuff like that, that really goes beyond a little bit about what we would talk about here because it's more of a reception thing. But again, you know, if you're close enough, it, it will work from a receiving standpoint. Transmitting, that's, that's a whole other ball game right there. So it's pretty simple. I've made quite a few... Homebrew antennas, they work pretty well. Again, QST or the AWRL website, they got some great publications available. Even Google's your friend on this one and YouTube videos on how to homebrew antennas. I made some twin lead J pole antennas that work really well. Again, you just you could put a thumbtack through it and put it next to a window. Again, I've made some handheld Yagi antennas. Some of them, you know, are, are monument to failure. But again, if you use the right equipment, I'm sure it would have worked out a whole lot better. Um, I'm sure I didn't use the right equipment when I did mine. But again, live and learn, right? I've made some wire antennas with some homemade balance and stuff like that. So making your own antennas is definitely something that can be done. And there's also plenty of plans out there on the internet. You don't have to just rely on formulas to get can work. So if you're going in to do a uh, antenna an antenna build time, let me know how you, how you make out what you're building. And let us also know how it's working out for you as well. It's a really fun part of the hobby. And uh, definitely thank you for bringing that one up. And again, if you're doing it and you want to discuss it on the podcast, I'd love to have you on the podcast to actually talk about how you're building the antennas and what uh, what you're using and and um, you know how well they're working out for you. So, Jim, really, really great question. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast and asking that one. And thanks again. Okay, so how do we do today? Let us know what you thought about today's podcast. You can go to scannerschool.com slash session 180 to leave me your feedback. You can leave a comment in the podcast notes there. You can also let me know on Twitter. I'm, I'm very active on there. I believe it's at scanner underscore school on Twitter, but just go to scannerschool.com slash Twitter and we'll redirect you right to our Twitter page. And also we are on Facebook as well. So before we get any further, let's pick a name out of a hat here and see who wins the free tutoring session for this month. So I got a spreadsheet here. I got four values in there. One, two, three, four in the order of questions received. Sorry, Chris, you were in the running for last month, not this month. So with that, we got one, two, three, four. All right. I hit the refresh button four times here. Ray, congratulations. You are the winner of this month's at Scan School. Send me an email. Phil at scannerschool.com. We will send you everything to know on how to uh, claim your free tutoring session and the code to use when you go to book it so that it ends up not costing you a dime. So again, please share the podcast with somebody you know who's in the scanner radio hobby. That is how we help more people. So make sure you forward it on your social media platforms or share it via email. And also make sure you subscribe to the podcast by clicking the subscribe button on your podcast player choice. If you're watching or listening to us on YouTube, again, we've got subtitles on there now for anybody who's watching those videos. You can go ahead and just click subscribe 
and that will let you know when the next podcast episode drops. Also, sign up for our email newsletter over at scannerschool.com. Finally, don't forget to watch us tonight or catch a replay over on YouTube where we answer your questions live, rapid fire, at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern U.S. time over on our YouTube channel on the first Tuesday of every month. So again, if you missed this month, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, and you'll know when we go live next. So with that, I'm Phil Lichtenberger, and this is Scanner School. We teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. 73.